and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our studies and we consider points that Sister White has presented for our edification at this time, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may more clearly understand items that are being presented and that we may take these items and make them our own. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for the opportunities we have to assemble together, to come before you as a group, for we can claim this promise that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. And you are most needed and welcomed at this time. Father, please direct us. Please guide us each one so that we might understand that which you would have us to know. Open our minds, open our hearts. Open our understanding so that these words will fall upon fertile ground. We ask that your angels attend us. We ask that your spirit may enlighten us. Help us now. Guide us and direct us in all things so that we may truly praise you and worship you in spirit and in truth. For this, Father, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Brother William. Are you with us this morning? Yes, I am. I want to thank you last night for the reference that you were providing in the meeting from Eight Testimonies, page 70, paragraph 3. Now, I want to ask you a couple of questions. When you were researching and you came across this reference from eight testimonies. Did anything strike you as odd about that testimony? Anything odd? <laughs> well, the fact that it brought up um, it brought up the imagination of the wicked man. And the ancient the ancient past, I was anything odd. I'm gonna say no, I can't I don't think so. Besides okay. the ancient, ancient of men. I mean, okay. the imagination of the man. Excuse me. Page and paragraph hit me in the face. Okay. Now I'm 70. I'm, 70 well, that's what I was searching out. Yeah, well, that's what I was searching out was the ancient path. I mean, that's what I was looking at at the time I was studying it. Brother Ron, I agree with you. 70 and paragraph 3. Yes, very interesting. Now, let's, let's consider for just a second what struck me odd about this testimony. When you take a look at it, the 
subject of this testimony from the pen of Sister White extends only six paragraphs. For me, that's very rare because I don't often see Sister Paragraph be so directly concise. So I had to ask questions. Now, the first question, I'm looking here very nicely at eight testimonies. As you pointed out, Brother William, this was chapter 13 in this section of eight testimonies. And the title of this chapter 13 is, Look to God for Help. However, if we were to go back just a few pages, there's another title that is also presented, and it says, A Departure from Right. And if we turn back just a little bit further, we have a subtitle that says, Working Against the Holy Spirit. If we're working against the Holy Spirit, are we not departing from right? Uh, yes. 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 Now, that chapter also rang a bell. <laughs> okay. 13, <laughs> rebellion. <Right>. Yes. <laughs> Now, as I considered carefully what you had presented last night, I went to look to see if there wasn't a source document. What is before you right now, letter 51B from 1898, is the source document that became eight testimonies 70 and multiple of their paragraphs now when we look at this this letter is written to the brethren in battle creek in 1898 who were the brethren in battle creek in 1898 at jones and wagner and Could we say that the Brethren in Battle Creek in 1898 oh, wait a minute. were the leadership of the church? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Yes. Yes, you're right. Since prophet, the prophets wrote more for our time than for theirs, who is she writing to today? Um, us. Us. Amen and amen. So, what we are going to do is we're going to read through this document where it is being said to the brethren in Battle Creek, we're going to apply this to the brethren in the movement. This is to each one of us. <clears throat> I am applying this to myself I invite each of us, brothers and sisters, to do the same. <clears throat> to the brothers and sisters within the movement, there are times when the truth must be spoken, whether men will hear or whether they will forbear, whether they will hear or whether they will turn a deaf ear. The Lord is greatly dishonored when those who claim to believe the truth fail to harmonize among themselves and make their appeals to lawyers. Will you study the word of God and heed its instructions on this point? The interests of the cause of God are not to be committed to men who have no connection with heaven. Ouch. It's been said on some of the presentations that I have been led to give that I have been administering verbal spankings. 
Yet, who is the author of what we've just read? The author is Sister White, but the Spirit is what led her. Amen. An ouch is about the nicest thing we can say. Right? Matters have been presented before me that have filled my soul with keen anguish. Let us remember that these matters were presented before her when she is thousands of miles away from the leadership and from the established church. She has is now 117 years at rest and is yet speaking to us. I saw, men link, I saw men linking up arm in arm with lawyers, but God was not in their company. Having many ideas regarding the work, they go to the lawyers for help to carry out their plans. I am commissioned to say to such that you are not moving under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. So, do you think she was actually talking about lawyers, lawyers, or yes. um, you know, the legalists in our movements? I I would say that that's an a, an excellent analogy. But let's remember, at our time right now, the movement cannot call itself. Seventh-day Adventist. No, we can't. Why? Because um, Seventh-day Adventism rejected these messages. And so, um, although our roots are in Adventism, we are not Adventists anymore. I disagree. Really? Yes. Can you... Can, uh, I don't want to turn this into a debate, clear. but can you I'm, explain? I'm always quite clear what a Seventh-day Adventist is. Um, it's not the organized church. Right. Right, yeah, if you I, look at it like that, I, for sure. We are always Seventh-day Adventists. That name, um, the church departed from Adventism. They're, not, they're the ones that aren't Seventh-day Adventists. You know, I actually never thought of it quite like that, but that's actually removed some scales on my eyes. Well, that that's the books of a new order. When Ellen White talks about the books of a new order, that they, they form a new organization. That's what happened in 1919. Right. Brothers and sisters, at this point, I have been made very aware over the last many years that the corporate church has no issue with a group assembling themselves and calling their fellowship a seventh gay Adventist fellowship. Yet a movement such as I'm this. I'm sorry. I'm kind of hard of hearing. What did you say? I'm aware. You said of, seventh gay? Yes. As in golf, alpha, Yankee. Hey, brother, the, brother um, Dwight. Yes. I'd rather you not say gay. I'd rather you say homosexual. Well, I'm a, because, I'm using, because you know you know the meaning of the word gay, right? It means yeah, happy. I know. Okay. But I'm also aware that there is such a church in California that is right now under the banner of the corporate church, but is most happy to refer to themselves in the manner in which I just did. 
they also lost lawsuit, didn't they? No, I believe that uh, the, the corporate church agreed to settle with them. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in many ways, we will find that as things proceed, many of us in the movement may be threatened with legal action for infringing upon the name Seventh Day Adventist. So here Sister White has said, I am commissioned to say to such that you are not moving under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Is it because there is not a God in Israel that you go to the God of Ekron? Second see, please see Second Kings 1 3. Men in responsible positions are uniting with those in the church and out of the church whose counsel is misleading. Is it necessary for the Lord to come to you with a rod to show you? that you need a higher experience before you can be fitted for connection with the family above? Will you link up with men who have a faculty for accusing and thinking and speaking evil of the things that God approves? In the name of the Lord, I tell you that you need clearer discernment and spiritual eyesight. What are we being told here? You know, Dwight, I read that same Bible verse this morning. Okay. When I was reading my worship this morning, I found it. I think that read that same verse. That same chapter, in other words. Okay. <clears throat> and what did you take away from it? I took away from it they that that if you you know if you go to um God act Ron, that God is uh, the God is not with you and it and that you know it, like the king he he decided he was gonna he was gonna go to the God the act Ron, and to find out whether he was gonna live or not and he found out by God he's gonna die well because of um Because of his um, unwillingness to come seek him instead of the, the God's Ekron. Is God all, is it not that God is always with us? Is it yeah. not that we make the decision to turn from God? Yes. So the men in responsible positions being shown here. who don't have spiritual eyesight have chosen to turn from God because of their accusing and thinking and speaking of evil things of which God approves. If the light which God has given you over and over again that missionary centers should be established in many cities, and that the labor and the means centered in the movement should be divided and planted in many places had been followed. The present state of confusion and dearth of means would never have been. Men located, centered at the head of the movement 
have disregarded the counsels of the Lord because it was more convenient for them to have their work centered where they wanted. God has left these to the results of their human wisdom, and its fruit is seen in present perplexities. Are we hearing anything further from Parminder? Do we see much from Tess? How much are we hearing from some of these others that have been highly critical of the messages that we have been addressing? Who among you, who is among you that feareth the Lord and obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Behold, all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourself about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you have kindled. This ye shall have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in sorrow. Isaiah 50, 10 and 11. Where else in the Bible do we find those that chose to walk according to the sparks of their own kindling? Where else in the Bible do we find those that chose to operate in the name of the Lord with strange fire. We're talking about the sons of Aaron that got drunk before they went to offer in the sanctuary. Their names were Nadab and Abihu, were they not? Right. And what happened to Nadab and Abihu? The Lord even told him not to even mourn, mourn for him. Aaron was not to mourn for those sons. All right. So here was Nadab and Abihu. They chose to walk in their own light. And as Sister Angela just pointed out, they were drunk when they went into the holy place. They accepted a doctrine not of God. Brother Dwight, in that yes. same chapter, in that same chapter, Second Kings, verse one, chapter one. Yes. We have that three steps. Okay. The first, you know, he sent the first fifty he sent. He had destroyed by fire, and then he had the second one that went destroyed by fire. But the third one, but the third one that was saved because he humbled himself. Correct. You have a one, five, three there. Very good. Now. Therefore, go to and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, so this is being said to those that study within the movement today. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ask ye now among the heathen, who hath heard such things, the virgin of Israel hath done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon, which cometh from the rock of the field? Or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? 
because my people have forgotten me. They have burned incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths, to walk in paths in a way not cast up. Jeremiah 18, 11 to 15. Again and again, the Lord has pointed out the work which the church in Battle Creek, which the movement today, and those where all through America are to do. There's a comment from the chat, and I agree with it. The comment was, by the grace of God, we cannot say, as said they. But yet, are we not seeing this today? Yeah, yes. They are to reach a much higher standard in spiritual advancement. They are to awake out of sleep and go without the camp, working for souls that are ready to perish. The medical missionaries are doing the long-neglected work which God gave the church, the movement. They are giving the last call to the supper which he has prepared. You know, as a personal testimony, It has been my privilege over the last several weeks to deal with a sister in another one of the churches in this area. Now, I found it very interesting that there are many points, especially of the right arm of the gospel, that this sister has accepted and embraced fully. Yet, there have been times that I have found that she's needed some encouragement. One of the points that she has accepted has been that of dress reform. Yet, many of the sisters within her own church have made comment that she dresses too conservatively, that in accepting the health reform, in accepting dress reform, that this is just, it's just too much, that you're not presenting yourself as well as you could. Her concern is not to be a temptation to other brothers, and yet, she's being told to shorten her skirts or to dress a bit more provocatively. Now, is this in keeping with the message of dress reform that Mrs. White had given? Well, it's like no. the opposite. The opposite. It's exactly the opposite. So when we have those within the church, within the corporate church, that are giving advice contrary to that of Sister White, do we not have those that have linked their arms with the world? Oh, yeah. Definitely. My brethren, why do you keep so many things bound up at the head of the movement or with the world? Why do you not take the tract and missionary work into other cities where there is much missionary work to be done? The many interests centering at the head should be divided and subdivided and placed into other cities. Why do you think there's so many of us right now in this movement 
that are in so many different areas. I mean, we're not all in one area. Is this not as God would have it? Sure sounds like it to me. You who think you are wise men may say, it will cost too much. We can do the work here in one place at less expense. Well, does not the Lord know all this? Does not God understand everything? Is he not he a God who understands all the unbelieving reasoning that holds so many interests in one place. He has revealed to you that centers should be made in all the cities. This would call many out from the head of the work to work in other places. In order to be carried forward or right, the medical missionary work needs talent. It requires strong and willing hands and wise discriminating management. But can this be while those in responsible places, presidents of conferences and ministers, bar the way? The Lord says to the presidents of conferences and to influential brethren, remove the stumbling blocks that have been placed before the people. So, who's stopping the work from going forward according to this letter? The head. Corporate. Presidents of conferences. Influential brethren. Isn't that amazing? Well, at this time, you know, everything was very centralized. And so, you'll see a lot of counsel leading up to 1901-1903, decentralization of the power. Right. So was in Battle Creek, and they didn't know what was happening in the field, and they made arbitrary decisions that hindered the work. But aren't we still seeing this same thing occurring now? Within the organized church? Yes. Um, well, yeah. Um, though I think we need to understand this in connection with our movement itself. Yes. Is when when we are seeing... elements where they are critical of the message that is being presented or the questions that are being asked. Is this not barring the way of the work to go forward? Yeah. So that, that's the thing, <laughs> you know, that uh, we saw even with FFA. Right. It is that, you know, my belief is that God directs each individual. Correct. And, and that, that we are to cooperate together. Right. Now, cooperation is not controlled from the top. Co cooperation is helping those that God is leading. Right. Um, through, through, through communication, through uh, sometimes financial help and things like that. But often what leadership does is it tries to control the work it, after people's own opinions and ideas about what should occur. And when something happens that they didn't approve or direct or uh, have any say in, then they take steps to, to stop what's happening. And, and we saw that with the movement with uh, the doctrinal analysis group. Um, we saw this uh, in lots of different ways that, um, now, Jeff himself, he was he was always had his ear to the ground and was looking for any any light that was coming from anywhere. I know. But um, 
you know, Parminder, Tess, and even lots of others, they, when something didn't come from them and they didn't have a say in it, then they shut it down. An example would be the November 22nd, uh, 2018 prediction. Right. It didn't come from them, so they didn't want to have anything to do with it. It must be error. Um, and, you know, so, so this happens everywhere where people want to control. The people in Battle Creek have not exercised their talents in planning and devising how they may plant the standard of truth in regions where the message has not been proclaimed and where decided efforts should be made. And the Lord has moved upon Dr. Kellogg and his associates to do the work which belongs to the church, but which was offered to them but which they did not choose to accept. Some in Battle Creek, instead of taking up the work given them of God, have, by following their own selfish way, blinded their spiritual eyesight and the eyesight of others. And God has placed his precious work in the hands of those who will take it up and carry it forward. God is in his holy place, and he dwells also with him who is of a humble and contrite spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Those who are doing the medical missionary work should have the full sanction and cooperation of the church. If they do not have this, they are hindered. Nevertheless, they will advance. It is not God's plan that there be two churches in Battle Creek because of the want of cooperation in this line. How much better it is to seek for unity of action. Again, from the chat, Isaiah 1, verses 5 to 9 is recommended. And the comment is made that the entire chapter is an indictment of apostates who think themselves worthy. If the medical missionary workers will carry this line of effort into churches everywhere, if they will work in the fear of God, they will find many doors open before them, and angels will work with them. Please read the invitation to the supper and the last call made. Study to see what is being done to meet the command of Jesus. I cannot understand why this indifference is manifested, why you should stand off and criticize and draw away. The gospel net is to be cast into the sea, and it draws both good and bad. But because this is so, shall men and women ignore the efforts made to save those who will believe and who will unite in the work of reaching that class of which Christ spoke in his rebuke to the Pharisees? Sinners and harlots, he said, go into the kingdom before you. See Matthew twenty-one thirty-one. Will you not see that even in the church there are those who have no connection with God? But Christ said, let the tares and the wheat grow together until the harvest. Then I will send my angels to garner out the tares, excuse me, to gather out the tares and burn them. But the wheat I will gather into my barn. When the Lord moves upon the churches, bidding them to do a certain work, and they refuse to do that work, and when some, with their human efforts united with the divine, endeavor to reach to the very depths of human woe and misery, 
God's blessing will rest richly upon them. Even though but few souls accept the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, their work will not be in vain. For one soul is precious, very precious in the eyes of God. Christ died for that soul in order that he might live through eternal ages. Let us study the 18th chapter of Matthew. This chapter should enlighten our eyes. Take heed, Christ said, that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which was gone astray? And if so, be that he find it. Verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father that is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Matthew 18, verses 10 to 14. There are many souls being rescued, wrenched from Satan's hand, by faithful workers. Some must have a burden of souls to find those who have been lost to Christ, one soul redeemed, over whom Satan has triumphed, bringing joy among the heavenly angels. You know, this last week, we talked a bit. Theodore shared how he came to hear the Advent message. My family was not that unlike what Theodore was talking about. I doubt we would have had much to do with this church from an evangelistic series. The way we heard of this message was because of two coal porters, husband and wife. And I've said many times that this couple, Horace and Mary Future, were the reason behind this family coming to understand the message of these last days. There are those who have destroyed the moral image of God in themselves. Now we're going to back up for just a second. Someone must have a burden of soul to find those who have been lost to Christ. And one soul redeemed over whom Satan has triumphed causes joy among the heavenly angels. There are those who have destroyed the moral image of God in themselves. If we choose to destroy the moral image of God, because we are choosing to walk according to sparks of our own kindling, we have none but ourselves to blame for our issues. The gospel net must gather in these poor outcasts. Christ said, I will make you fishers of men. Is she not using this same type of analogy here? Angels of God will cooperate with those who are engaged in this work. 
who make every effort to save perishing souls, to give them opportunities which many never have had. There is no other way to reach them but in Christ's way. Can these people be reached through ways that are devised by man? No. Uh, I had to think about what you said. No. As she states, there is no other way to reach these but in Christ's way. He ever worked to relieve suffering and to teach righteousness. Only thus can they be taken from the depths of hell. What passages of the New Testament come to come to mind when she's talking this way? What about the demoniacs? When they come to the shore, these two men that have demons, they are screaming at Christ because the demons did not allow them to be restrained. They're frothing at the mouth, wild of eyes, unkempt, dirty. But we today look upon as being homeless. Homeless with mental health issues. Exactly. And yet what happened? Well, after everybody else ran off, <laughs> yeah. uh, Jesus stood there and uh, they became calm. Um, didn't they... I think um, they couldn't, the, the, the disciples couldn't believe that they were looking at the same men when they seen them, if I seem to recall the story correctly. Right. What kind of a witness did they provide to that city the next day? Um, it was, well, nobody could believe it was them. <laughs> right. That was a, a, a tremendous witness. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, many people poured in because of it, didn't they? Exactly. Uh, it, remind, it reminds me of this <clears throat> amazing grace. He said that, you know, that I was once lost, now I'm saved. To me, that was the witness. It's a huge witness, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We but you see what we see when we see those guys coming at us. <laughs> We're like, ah, <laughs> let me get out of here. Uh, or I try to get around it or evade it. or or. But we're actually to face it. We will be confronted with many. God is going to allow us the privilege and the opportunity to share this final message with those that man and his methods cannot reach. Why is that? Please consider the Father has made a banquet for the wedding of his son. Many have been invited and have chosen not to attend. Right now, there will be those that will be searching the highways and byways 
because those that were privileged, those that were enlightened, those that were enriched with the word of God, with the spirit of prophecy, have turned their back upon what is presented. There will be those that will accept God at his word and will be at this wedding feast because they chose to listen. <clears throat> the workers must labor in love, feeding, cleansing, and clothing those who need their help. In this way, these outcasts are prepared to know that someone cares for their souls. The Lord has shown me that many of these poor outcasts from society will, through the ministration of human agencies who cooperate with the divine, seek to restore the moral image of God in others for whom Christ has paid the price of his own blood. They will be called the elect of God, precious, and will stand next to the throne of God. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, and from one end of heaven to the other. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. <clears throat> but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. And in an hour that he is not aware and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 24, 30, 31, 42 to 51. <clears throat> Brethren, be careful, very careful. There is a work being done by the medical missionaries which answers to the description given in Matthew 24, 48 to 51. The Lord is working to reach the most depraved. Many will know what it means to be drawn to Jesus Christ, but will not have the moral courage to war against appetite and passion. But the workers must not be discouraged at this, for it is written, In the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy 4.1 It is only those rescued from the lowest depths that backslide. Consider that. If we're being rescued, from the very depths, from the very bottom of the barrel, 
Are we more likely to backslide and doubt the word of our Lord? So uh, that with that little thing, I remember uh, Paul, or should I say Saul? Okay. And his story. Um, and one of the things that he said that I remember was that he referred to himself as the chief among sinners. The chief among sinners and the least of the brethren. And the least of the brethren. Uh, but doesn't she make a comment, I think, in, uh, in some of her other writings about... Um, I, no, it was right here in this one. I think I seen it was um, that you should uh, give the um, give the decisions to those that are the least considered in your movement. Right. <laughs> and, and Paul considered or Peter considered himself the least in that whole thing. So I, I could see that and why she would make that reference. Okay. And your question then would, uh, or her question would be, or your question, after the question that she asked. Um, Is would, it only those rescued from the lowest depths that backslide? <laughs> um, I would have to say no. Right. It's not only them, because Peter, or Paul, again, you know, considered himself to be the lowest. And we know, we know, just through the perpetuation of, of uh, his epistles um, and the and the flavor of them that we're pretty sure that he's going to be there. Well, you had that you had the evidence in Peter. He had two classes of people in him. He had the wicked and the righteous. That that's right. But Peter, impetuous, ardent. Loving Peter, the man who was willing to slice off the ear of the high priest's servant, he had to learn. But the words of Christ after the resurrection stung him. But Peter came to understand. Not only was he loved, but that he was wanted because he needed to lead his brethren by example. Yeah, and that probably didn't come to him until that tarrying time before right. the um, before the gathering, exactly. the Pentecostal gathering. Agreed. There are those in the ministry who have had light and a knowledge of the truth who will not be overcomers. That one statement is like a bombshell. Many would prefer to ignore it. They will not restrict their appetite and passions or deny themselves for Christ's sake. And many of the poor outcasts, even publicans and sinners, will grasp the hope set before them in the gospel and will go into the kingdom of heaven before the ones who have had great opportunities and great light, but who have walked in darkness. In the last great day, many will say, Lord, Lord, open unto us, but the door will be shut, and their knock will be in vain. <clears throat> Is it not a terrible thing to have to consider that so many pastors, that so many look up to, that view as being, that so many see as being great and holy men, they've had the light and a knowledge of the truth and that they are not overcomers. 
We should feel deeply over these things, for they are truth. We should have a high estimate of truth and of the value of souls. Time is short, and there is a great work to be done. If you feel no interest in the work that is going forward, if you will not encourage medical missionary work in the churches, it will be done without your consent, for it is the work of God, and it must be done. Brethren and sisters, take your position on the Lord's side and be earnest, be active, be courageous co-workers with Christ, laboring with him to seek and to save that which is lost. Is Sister White very clear here? Do we have any points of contention with what she gave in this letter? No, not for me. Okay. I look at it as it is written to me. Not just to not just to those people in the Adventist corporate church, but to me. It's I mean I don't see it any other way. Well, you, you remember what Theodore said earlier was um, it, 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 he more seen it as uh, being addressing the movement. And so um, it's true. It, it, it is addressed. If we consider ourselves to have been um, drawn out of the corporate church, um, but are still Seventh-day Adventists, um, you can kind of make but that we, connection there. But we're going to be held responsible even more than those ones in the corporate church because right. we, yes. got the, we got the more knowledge. We got the truth. Have. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's it's just an observation on of, of me. I'm not pointing my finger to anybody but me. Um, I, I was more concerned for myself than I was for others. And it's starting to, um, you know, being, it's, it's being driven home that it's being driven home that um, <laughs> I have to have that concern for others, not just for myself or actually have no consideration for myself and, and only for the others. Just an observation for me. I'm not going to disagree. I mean, when when Brother William brought this to the meeting last night, there were several points that were very direct from the way this is presented in Eighth Testimony. But when you read the entire letter, and this was sent directly to the leadership in Battle Creek in 1898. She doesn't pull any punches. She's saying it to us, each one of us today, just as surely as she was saying it. 125 years ago. Now, well, I apologize for bringing it up so ca casually last night. I was, I didn't realize it had all that, and you know, I just. I just seen, you know, the part that you was talking about imagination. It just, just didn't occur to me that it had, you know. So I apologize for that. No, Brother William, don't apologize. Yeah. Why is, would you? It this is <laughs> this is because God was leading you that this has been brought forward for our consideration today. Right. Praise God. Um, Amen. Amen. I, I do praise him. I just 
I just did, you know. <laughs> okay. Okay, you're humble. We get it. I don't apologize no more. Okay. <laughs> I love your guts, bro. Where we left off last week, we're going to go back over these three paragraphs, which I think tie in very nicely with what we've just read. We do not, we need to be very careful that we do not view in a wrong light matters connected with the work of God. We need to guard against the least injustice. Those who bear the burden of the work of winning souls to Christ are to be encouraged and to be helped. The Lord requires that unity exist in every church but the policy of consolidation must be guarded against. The workers in our institutions are to preserve their individuality. Each is to sense the responsibility resting upon him that he works under the divine leadership of the Lord Jesus. The workers are to counsel together and to seek to bring in ideas that are in harmony with the teachings of truth, but never, as long as time shall last, is an arbitrary man-ruling power to come in to take the place and authority of God. Have we seen any time where there are those that believe that they have the authority of God? The Lord has been instructing us to move forward. Shall we go forward or shall we stand still? Shall we not seek to increase in faith that we may work and wait in assurance and in confidence? The word of God is to be our guide under all circumstances. Are we to take the word of a pope who believes himself to be superior to God as our guide? Blind leading the blind. Or you could say, so even in this movement. <laughs> I know. You can say that, too, in some way. That's the point. Yeah. Now, as we were going through this from Ezekiel 20, we now find that we are to, as we have compared Ezekiel 20, verses 5 through 20, we should be comparing this against Ezekiel 18, verses 1 to 9. For those of us that remember the studies in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 18 is, is a fairly interesting chapter. Now, which of the visions is Ezekiel 18 connected with? It's the one that began the sixth year, the sixth month, and the fifth day. Did it not also begin in Ezekiel 8? Yes, that's the, where you find that date in Ezekiel 8, verse 1. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Amen and amen. So here we are in Ezekiel 18, still in this vision that began in the sixth year, the sixth month, and on the fifth day. God disallows the parable of sour grapes. He showeth his dealing with a just man and with the wicked son of a just father and with the just son of a wicked father. 
He declareth that the treatment of both son and father shall be according to their respective deserts. And the wicked, if he repent, shall live. But if he revolteth from his righteousness, he shall die. He that defendeth the equity of his dealings and exhorts all to repentance. This is the one chapter, a nice, clear example, that there's no such thing as once saved, always saved. Letter 65, 1896, which was of the non-published of Mrs. White's letters. The Lord will speak just the same, whether men will hear it or whether they will forbear. So did we not hear this exact comment when she wrote the prior letter to the leadership in Battle Creek that the Lord will speak just the same, whether men choose to hear or whether they choose not? The Lord's servants may be disapproved by the very ones whom he would help, whom, if they would let him, he would instruct, he would strengthen, bless, refine, and noble. But God calls for the faithful work to be done at all times and in all places. <clears throat> Read Ezekiel 3.11 and chapter 18. There's a great work to be done in our world. Every jot and tittle of capability and tact and ingenuity is needed. Messages of reproof and warnings will come to the people of God, to mothers, to fathers, to the children of Israel, that they may not move blindly. If those to whom these messages shall come will hear, if they will take heed with patience, and with a generous, teachable spirit, then the blessings of the Lord will come to them. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. As an earring of gold, an ornament of fine gold, so is a, reprover, a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, saying, For he refresheth the soul of his master. Proverbs 25, 10-13 Word of Ezekiel, the word of the Lord, came unto me again, saying, What mean ye, that ye... Use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. We find this initially in, in the book of Jeremiah. Where Jeremiah stated, In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. In Lamentations 5, verses 6 and 7, We have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Why is it a lamentation as Jeremiah saw this? That we have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Have, is this not saying that we have reached out to the world to those that will not study according to Miller's rules, 
we will not follow the path that God has laid before us because we're more satisfied with the path that man has put before us? What river are we sailing? Are we on the Ulai or are we on the Hittikel? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm asking there? Somewhat. Okay, then what am I what am I asking? <clears throat> well, it's, isn't it the two great rivers that um, Ezekiel was on, or one of the one was the river that he was on? I think I can't remember the story as clearly as I would like. Well, I'm I'm trying. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to mix this with another prophecy group that we find in the Book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we have one great prophecy that is given when Daniel is before, standing before the Uli. And in another prophecy, he is before the Hittikel. Now I'm going to give you a thought because we're coming close to the, to the end. We're not there yet, but we're gonna come close. But consider this. If we are looking at our Bibles at the moment, and we are at the book of Daniel, We have these prophecies that occur where Daniel is in one prophecy taken where he is now seeing that he himself is before the Uli. And in another, we find that he is before the river Hittikel. The, the river Hittikel occurs in Daniel 10. And if we take a look, I believe that he is before the Uli when he is in Daniel 8. Brothers and sisters, consider this. And this is something that, if I'm wrong, I'll be most happy to apologize. But I believe very directly that the vision that is given and accepted by those in Daniel 8, the vision by The river Uli is the vision that will take us to the Sea of Glass. Mm. And that the vision where Daniel is standing before the river Hittikel will carry those to the lake of fire. Mm. As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father. So also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Sin is a choice. 
if we choose to hang on to our sin, if we choose to hold our sin, if we choose to retain our sin, then what will happen to us? What are we being told? The soul. Go ahead. Don't go down that river. <laughs> yeah. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Right. Okay. There is nothing so offensive to God as sin. Instead of making void the law of God by continuing in sin, every truly converted soul will be walking in the path of humble obedience to all of God's commandments. They will search the scriptures that they might know the truth. Who hath bewitched the impenitent, the transgressor, that sin is chosen rather than obedience? It is the power of Satan that came to Adam and Eve and Eden, the deceiving, bewitching power of the fallen angel. They believe the lie he brought to them. The natural heart is so perverted that a large class love the lie more than they love the truth. Satan knows that if men and women accept the truth, they are lost to him. They will be on the Lord's side. He does not want that a single soul should be brought back to his allegiance to God in keeping his commandments. Therefore, it is his work to bring about every delusive attraction to make sin more agreeable to man. Man will follow on in transgression, notwithstanding that God has said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But who believes God's word before the word of Satan? Ye shall not surely die. The holy God hates sin. He will not tolerate in the Christian that which he condemns in the sinner. Then must the race perish? No. Thank God we can answer no. Hope is brought to them through Jesus Christ. A ransom has been provided. Christ has consented to become man's substitute in surety. He will pass over the ground where Adam failed. He will redeem Adam's disgraceful failure and fall. And through his perfect obedience to God's law, give man an opportunity to return to his allegiance to God. He will give him moral power that he may have strength to gain the victory over sin. How few talk of this great sacrifice of the life of Jesus to save the guilty sinner. If we appreciated this love manifested by God for our souls, we would be elevated by taking hold of the merits of Jesus Christ. For without the righteousness of Christ, man could not give to God perfect obedience. Christ takes upon himself man's sin. Christ imputes to man his righteousness. Is there a more direct example of righteousness by faith what do we need to allow to have righteousness by faith uh, the faith of Christ do we not have to allow Christ to take our sin do we not have to give our sin to him? Well, that's like the first step. Then when we have given the sin, when we have let go of the sin, when we have surrendered the sin, 
does this not leave Christ free to impute to us his righteousness? I've said this before. Why has Christ not returned? Is it not because the bride will not make herself ready? <laughs> if the bride will not make herself ready, can the wedding proceed? Uh, no. <laughs> so if we will not give up our sin, can Christ give us his righteousness? If we will not give up our sin, how can we become clothed in the wedding garments, Christ's righteousness? I mean, it's, to me, it's simple. Christ will give the moral power that we will have the strength to gain the victory over sin. We need that moral power. How many of us are willing to give up our sin? It has been shown to me that every church among us, excuse me, it has been shown every, every church among us, every faction of the movement needs the deep movings of the Spirit of God. Oh, we would point men to the cross of Calvary. We would bid them look upon him whom their sins have pierced. We would bid them to behold the Redeemer of the world, suffering the penalty of their transgression of the law of God. The verdict is that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That is a verdict and that is a promise. What promise do we want to accept? But on the cross, the sinner sees the only begotten of the Father dying in his stead, dying in my stead, and giving the transgressor life. All the intelligences of earth and heaven are called upon to behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Every sinner may look and live. Do not survey that, that scene of Calvary with careless, thoughtless mind. Can it be that angels shall look down upon us, the recipients of God's love, and see us cold, indifferent, unimpressible, when heaven in amazement beholds the stupendous work of the redemption to save a fallen world and desires to look into the mystery of Calvary's love and woe? Angels in wonder and amazement look upon those for whom so great salvation have been provided and marvel that the love of God does not awaken them and lead them to pour forth melodious strains of gratitude and adoration. But the result which all heaven looks to Behold, is not seen among those who profess to be followers of Christ. How readily do we speak in endearing words with, of our friends and of our relatives, and yet how slow are we to speak of him whose love has no parallel, set forth in Christ crucified among you. 
the love of our Heavenly Father in the gift of his only begotten Son to the world is enough to inspire every soul to melt every hard, loveless heart into contrition and tenderness. And yet shall heavenly intelligences see in those for whom Christ died insensibility to his love, hardness of heart, and no response of gratitude and affection to the giver of all good things. Shall affairs of minor importance absorb the whole power of the being, and the love of God meet no return? Shall the sun of righteousness shine in vain? In view of what God has done, could his claims be less upon you? Brothers and sisters, we're at a point where God has been taking this work into his hands. Things look disorganized. They look chaotic. They look as if nothing is right. Yet our Heavenly Father is yet preparing the people to give a final message. Our question today, do we wish and have the heart to surrender our sins to Christ so that his message, his gospel, may truly be presented before the world at this time. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, Help us to search, to understand, to surrender the sins of our heart, our hearts are deceitful above, above all things. May we surrender these sins so that we may be filled with your spirit so that in unity and truth we may be the people to give this final message clearly to this dying world. Help us that we may surrender all and be guided by you in all that you would have us to do. We thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath. We thank you for the prayers that have been answered. We thank you, Father, for this time that we have been able to spend together. Direct us now. Please be with us through this Sabbath day. May others see only your character in all that we do. For this, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.